Oh, wow. If you're wondering if this is really happening, it is. Jay is here. Come on. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Let's take a look at Psalms 150. I'm sorry, Psalms 57. Psalms 57. Very quickly, uh, we're just going to look at Psalms 57, verse 2 and I believe 6. Psalms 57. Verse 2 says, I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me. <laughs> As we were wrapping up and... Shayla and Diamond were getting down as, as they were just walking down. I just kept hearing that. Give them praise. Shout for joy. Shout for victory. Shout in appreciation. Because he is the one that makes it happen. Amen. You know, since Saturday, the Lord's been making it abundantly clear to us that there is more that he wants to show to us. Come on, there is more that the Lord wants to reveal to you and I. However, as long as you are trying to make things happen, you're not going to see all of what he wants to do for you. Because when you are still of the mindset that you have to make it happen, then whatever God reveals to you that he wants to do, then becomes a burden to you because you're trying to figure out how to do that which you see. And the Lord says, no, 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 no. I am the one who is called faithful. I am the one who will perform it. You know, the Bible says that we are more than a conqueror. And the reason why we are more than a conqueror is because we received that victory from the one who did battle. If you were the one who went to war, then you are the conqueror. And then you have to always watch your back because when you conquer people, you always are mindful of the fact that they may want to retaliate they may want to come and claim back the land that you took claim back the crown that you took claim back the children that you took you know you always have to be on God but when you are more than a conqueror then it is not your it's not your problem because the conqueror was the one who went out to do battle and that's what the Bible says the Bible says we are more than conquerors because of him that loved us so what guarantees your victory is not your ability to overpower the enemy, is not your wit, is not your might, but it is in fact the gift of God. What guarantees your victory is the love of God. And in as much as your strength may be inconsistent and your ability to, to be faithful may be elusive from time to time, one thing that is always consistent is the love of God. And because God wants you to remain a victor, he decided to make the only requirement for your victory his love that never fails. The faithfulness of God is such that he does reveal himself again and again he does go the extra mile again and again to let us know how much he loves us psalms 57 verse 2 again the bible says i will cry out to god most high i will shout out his name i will call on his name because he is the one that performs all things for me praise the lord the Bible says, my heart, in verse 7, is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. I like the, the translation that says, I will sing and I will make music. Because some people think they cannot make music. You leave that to Emmanuel and Bennett. But the reality of it is, you also can make music. You know, God is happy to listen to you. Just clap. Bible says clap your hands all you people because God knows that all the people will may not learn how to play musical instruments so he decided to allow himself to be pleased by your clapping and this the connection between verse 2 and 7 is something that I would want to expound on maybe briefly but maybe not but I will expound on it you see the Bible says, you see, as I looked at over there, I, I looked over there and I saw my sister Roberta 
and I heard you saying that I will count victory upon victory and you were not you were not saying that because you just thought of it you were saying it because you were repeating what the angel of the Lord was letting you know concerning yourself it was revealed to you that you will count victory upon victory and in fact I saw the trophies and there were a lot of them and so I want you to know that for the one way that the enemy has come against you they would have to flee seven ways now the beauty of the enemy fleeing seven ways is because they came in through the window but because of the urgency of the intervention of God they would have to go out through doors so every time they leave they open a door for you to go through so I tell you what the opposition that has come against you has only submitted themselves on to the instrumentation of the mercy of God for your deliverance for your elevation and for your promotion in the mighty name of Jesus and so I said to you woman of God say as the Lord has revealed to you I will count victory upon victory praise the Lord that is the reason why come on God is good praise the Lord that is the reason why I always say you need to come with an expectation so excited to have our brother Ryan here. He's got some, praise God, good to see you. He's got some great updates for us when the time comes, he will share. But just thank God, thank God for your consistency. Thank God for the, 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 the honor that you put on the ministry of the word. I don't think, other than Anne, I don't think anyone has seen as many of our YouTube videos as you have. At least going by the comments, you know, Ryan goes there and is like, oh, that, that one, I take that one, I receive that one, I say amen to that one. So if you've been on YouTube and you see a Ryan, that's him. If you've seen him in the comment section, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So, but let me tell you something. The Lord, the Holy Spirit said to me, he says, do that quickly because I know you want to. And then we're going to continue on this notion of coming with an expectation. The reason why it is critical for you to come with an expectation is because wherever God has put his name, there usually is angelic activity. Because, you see, the Lord did not just, he doesn't go around putting his faces or putting his robe. He puts his name. And what is his name? The Bible says his name is Jehovah Sabaoth the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts means the, the Lord of all spirits, the, the, the captain or the Lord of the army of angels. And when you see someone who commands an army, when they move angels or whoever they're commanding moves along with them. And that was the reason why Jesus said to the centurion and he looked at the people around, he pointed the centurion out and says in all of Israel, I have never seen faith like this man because the man was describing the nature of God from just his own perspective of the mundane. He says, I am a man under authority. I say to this one, go and it goes. To this one, come and it comes and do the servant that is in my house, do this. And he does so. And Jesus says, wow, that is faith like I have not seen in Israel. And the reason being, he recognizes the man, the centurion, was saying things that were exactly like God operates. And so when that man moves, he has an army moving with him. And so whenever God, the Lord of hosts, when he comes into a place, the angels are there as well. And angels were not designed to be idle. The Bible says they are made to be ministering spirits to those of us who are heirs of salvation together with Christ Jesus. I tell you what, the angels of the Lord are not on a break, neither are they retiring until everything that was promised to you is delivered to you and that you have taken possession of it until you have taken possession of all of your inheritance in Christ Jesus they cannot sit idle because Jesus says that a servant is not allowed to take a break until his master is pleased Luke 17 and so I know that those angels whenever they come along with the father to the place where he has put his name they set up their ladder that goes from here to heaven and the bible says they ascend and descend upon that ladder so when you come with an expectation of 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 by faith of confidence in god you have an expectation that faithful is he who has promised who will do it when you come the angels begin to deliver on your behalf simply because you gave them something to do 
And so that is it. You know, the meeting is just getting started. And, and you, you will see it. You know, because by the grace of God, gone are the days wherein <laughs> it takes a while for certain things to manifest. When are we talking about these days? Within a short period of time. Not because we've gotten so much better, but because the time is being sped up that much quicker. It is not us yet again, but it is Him that is performing these things. Praise the Lord. I'm going to show you something very quickly in the book of Matthew chapter 27, and we may come back to these Psalms in just a jiffy, but come with me to the Matthew 27. And we're going to look at the uh, very toward the end verse 33 and it says and when they had come to a place that was called when they had come to a place called Golgotha that is to say the place of a skull when they had come to a place that is called Golgotha a place of the skull that place where Jesus was crucified was a place that had always been known to be symbolic of death, even though the people did not know why. They may not have had a full understanding of it, but heaven had orchestrated for men who walk by the place, who talk of the place, who tell tales of the place, who promise to visit the place to utter that it will be a place of the skull and the reality of it is that men who may not have had understanding may have had fears of that place because it's associated with death i have come to announce to you today that the same place that you may have associated with lack with death and with darkness is the same place that the lord has chosen to mark the end of your opposition because that place that was called the place of the skull was where they thought they were going to slay the Lord of glory. But it ended up being where the Lord of glory got sin slain. I tell you what, in the mighty name of Jesus, let us begin to see with the eyes of heaven that the things that we have whined about are things that we're supposed to give praise about. The things that we have complained about, the things that we have screamed and said, oh my goodness, this thing has come upon me. Those same things have come to make sure that your victory is guaranteed. And so now let me tell you what I have not said before, but I want to say it now. When we read Psalms 57 in verse 2, it says, I will cry unto the Lord. Many of us are crying unto things. Many of us, we see situations and circumstances and sometimes we see even destructive habits within us. And rather than cry unto the Lord, the one who performs regardless of your weakness, we cry unto things. We magnify pain. We magnify limitations. We magnify sorrow. We're speaking death instead of speaking life. I want you to have this in your heart today, folks, that the place of the skull is not the death of you. It is the death of that which has come to kill you. You see, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. What death was sin started handing out from the beginning was death. And what was handed to sin itself was death. And someone is saying, I'm not convinced that sin died. I'm going to prove it to you today that sin died. The Bible says that Jesus was not made a sinner. But that he who knew no sin was made sin. And that was the moment the enemy lost the plot without even knowing it. So when there was all that aggravation and aggression to nail Jesus to the cross, they were not nailing him to the cross. They were nailing sin to the cross because there was an exchange that the Almighty performed while men slept. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ gave himself for us. He became sin because he knew what was about to happen. He knew that hands were about to be laid on him and that he was going to be crucified and nailed to the cross. And why not just do a quick exchange and let the enemy be slain instead? He was made sin and sin died at the place of the skull to fulfill the prophecy of David that said the ones who dig a pit 
are the ones that will fall into it. Every machining of the enemy against you in the season that we're in is about to meet its Golgotha. Simply because the Lord has chosen to elevate you from surviving to overcoming. I tell you this today, communion house. The Lord has been dealing with me concerning y'all because when I came in here and I prophesied and I said we are going from surviving to overcoming, the Lord said to me, look at what is happening. Your brothers and sisters are thinking now they have to do more because it's now a challenge. That the, the challenge is on. We have to go from surviving to overcoming. How many people thought like that? How many people felt like now we need to strive a little harder? Because now we are being called to come up higher. We have been told that we have been surviving and it's time to quit just surviving, to do more than surviving. How many people have been a bit more intentional in the way they resist temptations that come into their thoughts? How many of you have been a bit more intentional in saying, you know, Lord, this season, I'm not going to be left behind in survival mode. I'm going to be in overcoming mode. Oh, yes. Even if you don't raise your hand, the Lord's already revealed to me that which been going on in those minds of ours. And the Lord says to me, I want it to be a fun season because at the end of the day, it is not you, it is I who will perform it. I am guaranteeing that you will overcome. Praise the Lord. The Bible says that they took him to a place called Golgotha, a place that was marked for death. But the reality of it was Jesus fulfilled what David said and also a promise that he made to us. Remember in John chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. When Moses received that insight from the Lord on how to stop the serpent from striking the people dead, because you know the serpent is symbolic of, the, of Satan, symbolic of the one in whom iniquity was found. The Bible says in Satan, iniquity was found. The one that brought sin to this realm. He is the serpent. And when the serpent came and started striking the people dead because of their violations, simply because there is a spiritual principle that says, he who breaks the hedge, the serpent will bite him. We have all broken the hedge. Romans chapter 3, the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have broken the hedge and that is the reason why the serpent had the right or the legal or legal the serpent had the legal grounds to come after us with death because a soul that sins must die. But the manifold wisdom of God was such that the same serpent that was killing people was the one that was killed, was the one that was strung around the rod of judgment and lifted up. And what is the significance of that, you may ask? The significance of that is because the Lord wants you to see the spectacle of the fall of the enemy so that you can know that you have nothing to worry about. If I tell you that I've taken care of the enemy but you do not see the proof, a part of you may still be waking up in the middle of the night window to see if the enemy is coming. And that is the reason why the Lord himself has put the enemy on a stake so that every time you're about to worry, you look and you see that it is over because he, the Lord Jesus, made an open show of them triumphing over them in it. And someone is like, okay, I get it, but why do I still struggle with the things that I struggle with? Every one of us, we have an opportunity by God through the shadow of the flesh to see once again the fall of Satan. You have an opportunity every time you see the thoughts come, every time you see the temptation come, every time you see the 
weakness rear its ugly head. You have an opportunity to visualize your weakness on the stake and say, this weakness has already been nailed to the cross. This serpent has already been put on the stake of judgment. What I am looking at is the proof of my salvation. And that was why Jesus says, for as many people as will lift up their eyes will be saved. I want you to lift up your eyes and stop looking down at yourself. This is not a season to look down on yourself in pity. This is not the season to look down on yourself as the problem because you are not. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Quit looking at yourself as the prayerless one. Quit looking at yourself as the one that is still struggling with unforgiveness. Quit looking at yourself as every one of those things that constitute sin that Jesus already got nailed to the cross. Start looking up and seeing that the proof is there that the Lord has overcome on your behalf so that you can free your mind from the entanglement of guilt and condemnation and begin to live as the righteousness of God that you are in Christ Jesus. Repentance. Repentance is the changing of one's thinking. To repent means to change your mind. As long as we're thinking that we have to do this and do that to earn God's approval, we will not have any energy or time left. We may not have any energy or time left to actually bear fruits and do the good works. And that is the reason why we're so occupied with self. You know, there are many of us, there are times wherein the angels of the Lord open up the portals to the windows of heaven. They open up the portals to the blessings, asking for you to take what you need. But you keep saying to yourself, I'm not qualified because I haven't prayed enough today. I'm not qualified because I can't stop thinking evil thoughts. I'm not qualified. And so you tell the angels to come another day. And the angels know that as long as you are in the flesh, you will not be qualified ever by your own ability. You need to be reminded always that all things have been perfected which concerns you. I'm going to share with us a couple of things tonight. Maybe about four things that the Lord wants you to separate yourself from so that you can enjoy all of what he has done for you in this season in this season that is called your season of overcoming number one maybe number two because what what i just said is one of them but i would say it again in another way but come with me to romans chapter 1 verse 4 real quick romans the first epistle of paul to the people of rome And this is what it says in verse 4 to begin with. Verse 14, sorry. He says, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and unwise. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and unwise. Now in verse 15, it says, in verse 16, it says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. You are a debtor to the wise and unwise because you have received a gift that is a free gift that you need to pass on. We need to start to live our lives with the consciousness of the privileges that we have in Christ Jesus. We do not owe God a favor in return for all of what he's done for us. When he gave himself for us, he's not asking for us to give him, to give ourselves back to him. He gave himself for us as an example so that we can learn what it means to love. Greater love, Jesus says, has no man than this, than for a man to lay down his life for his friends. So when you look at what God has done, he's done it so that you can pass it on. The Bible says freely have you received, therefore freely give. 
So I need to give that which I have received and until I have done so, I must walk around with a sense of indebtedness. Because with much privilege comes much responsibility. Now the reason why we read verse 14 is because sometimes we feel usually that we are only in debt to the wise, to the people who do right by us. Oh, you're kind to me, I'm going to be kind to you. Oh yeah, you're a good guy. Every good turn deserves another. But the Bible says you are a debtor to the wise and to the unwise. To the ones who are civilized. Because at the time, the Greeks were the most civilized. The ones who were well behaved. The ones who would treat you kindly. The ones who would not get ahead of you in traffic. The ones who would not honk even though they know you're driving like you've lost your mind. The ones who would just let you get away with things. Those are the Greeks. The Lord is saying, not only do you owe the Greeks, you also owe the barbarians. The barbarians here represent the people who just want to do what they want to do. Regardless of whether you're there or not, they don't care about you. They represent uncivilized people. They represent uncruth people. They represent unrefined people. They represent people of all age, size, and races who do not care about you, but just want to do life the way they want to do life. If they run into you along the way, that's perfectly fine, as long as they can keep going. And the Lord is saying, you owe those guys. And why do you owe them? Verse 16. Verse 16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. The gospel is the good news. And that good news is the power of God unto salvation. Now, what is that good news? Psalms 52, 57 verse 2 is the good news. That God is the one that performs all things. That is the good news. Jesus says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Go and tell them that I have taken sin. Put sin on. I became sin. Nailed sin to the cross. So that every time they look up and they see all of the inconsistencies, they see all of the judgment, they see all of the terrifying repercussions, that means I have taken care of it because it's put up so that you can see that it's already dealt with. That is the good news. And that good news is the power of God unto salvation. The reason why I owe those guys is because I'm not the one performing the righteousness of God that I have become in Christ Jesus. So what has this got to do with you overcoming? What this has to do with you overcoming is you are not going to enjoy the full fare or transportation from survival to overcoming if you think you are the one paying for the ride. If you keep thinking you are the one paying for the ride, oh, I, I, this is because of me. Let me tell you something, one of the biggest obstacles that we have to deal with is other people. And the Lord wants to make sure that you and I, in this season, become overcomers for real. Not part-time overcomers, but full-time overcomers. People who are not just surviving other people's bad behavior because somehow you manage to recover from it but people who are no longer able to sustain injuries from other people's bad behavior do you know that Jesus says when they came to him how many times shall I forgive anyone who wrongs me Jesus says well 70 times 7 basically he was telling them as many times as it takes as many times as required now don't forget from God's perspective forgiving other people their trespasses is called forgiving them of the debt that they owe so if you do not forgive somebody that owes you now you owe them Jesus told his disciples because they asked him a trick question. They said, how many times can my neighbor who wrongs me keep coming to ask me for forgiveness? Jesus says, as often as it takes. 
But the reality of it was he was meeting them where they were at. I've shared with you the maturity model of a believer about four or five years ago. I've said it again, or maybe once every year I talk about it, but for those of you who may not have heard it, the maturity model of the believer is that when you are still, uh, when you're still at level one of maturity, when people offend you and ask for forgiveness, you forgive them. That's level one. Level two is when people offend you and do not ask for forgiveness, you still forgive them. If I went, they offend you and they think you are the one that offended them. What do you do? You forgive them. Jesus told his disciples after they graduated from level one of, oh, if someone comes to ask for forgiveness, do I forgive them? Jesus says, yes, forgive them. And then after a while, he was like, okay, now it's time to elevate you people's understanding. He says, if you come before the Lord with an offering and then you know that someone has ought against you, that's the high road. You're not even talking about someone that I have something against. You're saying, if I just have any inkling, the Bible says, if you know that someone has ought against you, that means somewhere in my mind, I'm like, yeah, I don't think this person is happy with me. I think they may have taken offense at what I said. They are the ones who have something against me. They haven't even come to ask for forgiveness. Jesus says, go and make peace. That's level number two. Okay, so if you're new to this kind of teaching, feel free to assess yourself on this scale and then go make a t-shirt and put the number on it so the next time we see you, we'll know what level you're at. And then level three is the overcomer level. And that level three, that is the overcomer level, is described this way. Jesus says offenses will not but come. But happy is he who is not offended for my sake. So Jesus is saying, I want you to get to a level wherein you don't even have to forgive. Because there is no offense in the first place. Now let me tell you something. Is the overcomer life good or is it good? <laughs> to get there is hard because Jesus says narrow is the path. And difficult is the way. But it doesn't matter how difficult it is. I'm not the one performing it. It is the Lord that is at work in me. Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So the Lord is saying. I want you to be full time overcomers. And one of the things that I want you to do first of all. Is think like somebody that owes other people. As opposed to somebody that is being owed by other people. If you walk around as somebody who is in debt to the Gentile, I mean to the Greeks, to the barbarians, to the wise, and to the unwise. Do you know how difficult it is for you to be offended at somebody that you are owing? <clears throat> Let me say that again slowly. So let's say that Alan is owing me a million dollars. I know, I, I was ready for this. That's why I got background music. Because I know you're all going to be quiet on me. If, I'm, if Alan is owing me a million dollars, I thought Alan was going to say amen. Because imagine how much credibility you have to have to owe somebody a million dollars. <laughs> Alan, don't play. If Alan is owing me a million dollars and he decides to throw a party for his baby girl and I come late to the party, just unusually late, yeah, I had to say that for my Nolita's sake. Because as soon as I said, come late, I saw the looks of like, okay. So it was like, yeah, that's not news. But let's just say, I came late. Do you think Allah is going to be like, oh man, this is, this is, this is horrible. You're just coming. People will be like, oh, this is, this is awesome. At least I'm glad you came. Simply because he owes me a million. So what is a million compared to the apology that I owe him? You put my little apology for being two hours late on the scale of a million dollars. It doesn't even move the scale. What happens is when we have a sense of indebtedness to people, we don't take offense easily simply because they are already several 
several credits ahead of us in that transaction. There's several points in. You have, you are still playing catch up. Let me tell you this from the perspective of a husband. Of a man married to a woman. Because men have the gift of <laughs> you can call it you can call it you can call it selective vision. Sometimes we don't see what we don't want to see. So you do all kinds of things that you're supposed to apologize for, but you choose not to even see that you've done it. And then you just keep walking around doing stuff. And on top of that, if you were raised in a culture that makes demands, you even still make demands for things. And you're like, why is this not happening in this house? What is the meaning of this? Unbeknownst to you, you are in debt. They are still cleaning up after you. All of the stuff you were supposed to do that you haven't done. Someone is picking up the slack. And then you come out and you raise your chin and you're asking, well, what's going on in this house? You see, from that perspective, I have come to learn to always think of myself as someone who may have done things that I'm not aware of. Because it helps me to have a posture of humility. So that whenever I do something nice, I don't expect to be treated like his majesty. Just because I've done something nice, because I tell myself, hmm, who knows what else I am still in the red for in this house so let me wait until they tell me that i am in the blue so because i have thrown a little kindness into this part it sometimes is as mundane as let me tell you what happened about two weeks ago i washed i took my car my wife's car to the car wash at, at home i first of all scrubbed all of the inside peeled everything clean because even though my wife does not know how to clean cars she knows how to assess cars for cleanliness she might not even know where the hoover is or maybe even what and what the hoover is but when she looks and there is something that isn't right she'll be like i thought you said you were cleaning this car so i did all of that i cleaned it inside i took it to the car wash and i came back and i was feeling like i have overcome But little did I know that the time that I applied in cleaning the car was time that I was supposed to spend preparing for an event we were invited to. So now I became the reason why we were late, even though her car was the reason why I was late. But this is where trouble begins in some homes because then the husband is like, don't you see that I've been doing this for you? And most women, their attitude is, and so... Because women believe that when you do what you're supposed to do, right thing, at, oh, there you go. right thing at the right time. But the reality of it is this. As a husband, I have come to learn that if I always think of myself as someone who may have owed a debt that I'm not even aware of, I will thread carefully, not live in fear, but just behave myself. Simply because as men, we are prone to ego and we usually like commendation. The reason why men like to be commended is because men were wired to be honored. So you have to know the difference between being honored and being showered with commendations all the time. Because sometimes you may not get commendation even though you're still being honored. You just have to learn how to live with it until you can get your, your negatives eliminated and have more positives. So the reason why that is important in learning how to live as an overcomer is because God is here letting you know that he is the one performing all of what concerns you to keep you at the level of an overcomer. But as long as you are there, he is lifting you up, but you are trying to pull other people down because you have chosen not to forgive their debt and you have chosen not to pay what you owe. God cannot help you stay an overcomer. Jesus says, ask the Father for daily bread and he will give you. He said, but when it comes to forgiveness, 
you have to forgive those who trespass against you and then your heavenly father will forgive you. I cannot choose to live the life of an overcomer if every thought of my heart is seeking to pull somebody down. And some of us were so good, we don't pull people down, but we withhold good from people because we believe they do not merit it. And the Lord is saying, we need to put an end to overcompensation and underpayment. We overcompensate the Greeks in our lives, the wise, the people who treat us kindly, we idolize them. And the ones who treat us badly, we demonize them. The Lord is saying we need to live in a balance. And that balance is to be like your heavenly father who makes it to rain upon the good and the evil. I live my life and we all should live our lives as though we owe a debt. Many years ago, I was at a youth meeting and somebody was misbehaving next to me. He was annoying all the girls. And I just looked at him. I was like, hey, apologize. And one of the girls said, but he's not you. We know you. You are always apologizing. You must be really troublesome at home. And I was like, well, that's one way of looking at it. You're not too wrong, but that's not why I apologize. You know, she made the connection that this one is always quick to apologize. So he must be of that custom because he's always getting into trouble. And I said, no, that's not the reason why I'm quick to apologize. I said, because of the fact that most times people don't just wake up and say they want to make trouble. Something must have gone wrong and I may not see it. So I apologize first. Let there be some kind of calm and then maybe we will see who was really wrong or who was right. The reality of it is this. Many of us, when it comes to being able to give that which we don't think people merit will struggle. When it comes to offering that apology, when it comes to offering that explanation, when it comes to letting that person just have the moment, let them just win that argument. It's not that important. Let them just have it. It's not that precious because your peace is more precious. When it comes to doing that, we struggle simply because we just don't think it's right. But the Lord is saying, because of all of what you have received that you did not work for, other people need to receive something of you also. I'm going to talk about the second thing today. But before we get into the second thing, I want to take us to another verse of scripture. Just to fully explain this, come with me to Psalms 35. Because the power of God works for you as much as you let it work for others. Because it is called power for a reason. If it's called power, it has to flow. Power that doesn't flow is an ineffective kind of power. If there is electricity in the wall and you don't have a way of connecting to it to make it flow into your phone, your phone will die and there is still power in the wall. So power has to what? Power has to flow. And we're going to talk about a little physics here, but let's read Psalms 35 or 7. The Bible says, For without cause, they have hidden their net for me in a pit, which they have dug without cause for me. This is the man of God, David. He was assessing the situation of his life. And he was able to identify that some people have gone out of their way without reason, without a cause, dug a pit for him. Now, how do you handle people like that? Do you still feel like you owe them anything? Do I need to go and say, well, uh, thank you for digging this pit. Can I, how much did it cost you? Can I pay you for it? We don't, we don't say things like that. Immediately, we feel justified to do whatever is in our hearts to do. We feel justified to cut them off. We feel justified to cuss them out. We feel justified to ask God to bring destruction upon them. Even though Jesus says, pray for your enemies. 
we feel justified. And the reason why God is bringing out this point is because in the equation of your overcoming, there is only one kind of justification that can exist. Only one. And that justification that is easy, that is lasting, and that keeps you overcoming full time is the justification that comes by grace and not of works. So let me explain this very slowly because I didn't share this with you but a couple of days ago, might have been about two weeks now, I was taking up in the vision. I mentioned it very briefly, maybe two weeks ago. Alan, if that's for me, you're in the spirit. I was taking up, I mentioned it, I think I mentioned it maybe about a week and a half ago when I was talking about the Good Samaritan and talking about the fact that people will come before the, before the presence of the Lord, thank you, and be denied simply because they were busy focusing on fulfilling the things that were glamorous, the miracles, the signs and wonders, but they neglected the least of the brethren. I told you of, of how they were thrown out because Jesus says, depart from me, I do not know you, you work as of iniquity because when I was hungry, you didn't feed me and all of that. But when I was taking up in this vision, one of the things that I saw constantly being emphasized to the ones that are coming to assess us is to look out for what things we have done for others. The emphasis when heaven comes to earth as jesus says i am coming and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work the lord is not looking for the monuments that you built he's looking for the lives that you touched when i came out of that vision i was thankful to god but then at the same time i was a little terrified because I'm like, we are in a world that puts so much on what you can do for yourself. They put so much premium on what you can do for yourself. It doesn't matter how many people you mislead into buying the wrong product as long as you sell your quota. You talk to salespeople in the marketplace. It doesn't matter how many people buy that product that don't need it. As long as you have met your quota. You're good. And the focus is, man, I need to meet my quota. I need to meet my quota. I need to do this. I need to do that. We, we, because we have been schooled repeatedly in this Babylonian system to look out for us. And looking out for self is the bane of survival. And so if we continue to look out for our own interest, we will never get out of survival. Because looking out for your interest can only get you survival. But to become an overcomer, you need to let another look out for you while you look out for others. And so this is what the Lord is letting us know. That you can only find that grace by allowing for justification that comes by the will of God as opposed to justification that comes by the will of man. And so when you look at what David is saying in here, David says, I've recognized that there are some people who do not mean well for me. They are unwise because if they were wise, they should have known that the ones who dig the pit are the ones who will fall into it. So I will do something about it. The moment you allow that offense to register, you are bringing in another kind of justification. You bring it to disqualify somebody, but it disqualifies you also because the Bible says with the same measure that you measure, it will be measured back onto you. Let me tell you something. May we not be asked to get up from where we're seated in Christ Jesus to leave the room. May we not be asked to leave the room. So to those once saved, forever saved people, let me tell you the parable that Jesus told. And it is also one of the proverbs of the preacher, Solomon. Solomon put it this way. He says, when you are invited to an event, when you get there, do not choose for yourself the, a seat next to the celebrant. He said, because what if someone more important than you comes and they ask you to get up? 
He says, by then, all eyes would have seen you as you are getting demoted to the back seat. And God help you if all the back seats are taking you, you might end up standing for the event. He says, it is better for you to go to a lowly place and then let them see that your place is vacant and then call out and say, hey, oh, look at that scripture. Isn't an amazing scripture when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit in the best place. Lest one more honorable than you come. <laughs> you see, that is what happens to many of us. We want the best place. We want to be called the apple of his eyes. We want to be the people. We want to be the ones who have found favor in the sight of God, but those other people, they're not qualified. And the moment we downgrade anybody, guess what happens? The need for the mercy of God in their lives magnifies so intensely that God chooses to make them more honorable. Hmm. The Bible says, do not wish evil upon your enemy so that the Lord does not look upon the wickedness of your heart and choose to then turn to them and favor them over you. May we, I'm going to say it again, because I know what things I have seen. May we not be asked to get up and leave simply because we did not pay all of our debts. Jesus paid your debt on the cross and that makes you indebted to other people. Let us settle this thing once and for all. Before we think about all the nations we want to go to, all the mission trips we want to go on, all the books we want to write in his name, all the hungry and homeless people that you want to feed in his name, before we continue to think along the lines of the miracle signs and wonders and kingdom shows, let us first of all remember that there might be somebody, wise or unwise, Greek or barbarian, that we owe forgiveness to. That we owe love to. Some people, you just owe them a phone call. Because of what they said, they've been trying to call you, you've been ignoring their call. You've ignored their call to the point wherein they now have gotten the message not to call you anymore. Because you've made it abundantly clear. The Lord is saying, owe no man nothing but the love. Follow peace with all men. The use of the word peace in that expression means be settled with all men. Settle your accounts with other people. Because without that peace, that settlement and holiness, no man shall see God. God is bringing us to a place where the enemy cannot pull us down. The only thing that can pull us down is the weight of the debt that we owe to other people. The love that we are holding back. And as I'm speaking tonight, I am thankful to God because what the Lord has shown to me is exactly what is happening in this place. And that is that the Lord is allowing for us to present our hearts for healing. Present our, our, our hearts for deliverance. There are certain notions and principles by which we live our lives that are not of God. The double standard has to go. Only one justification. If I have been justified just because God loves me, then everybody else gets a pass. Because I have received freely and I need to pass it on. I know that I said one more scripture, but I will quickly read another one. John, I mean Genesis chapter 17. We're going to read very speedily from verse 1 through 9. Genesis 17. Because once we are able to overcome this temptation for self-righteousness and self-justification, none of us will make it into the kingdom of heaven putting on two garments. You cannot have the garment of the righteousness that is a gift and the righteousness that is because you are good. You have to choose one. Which righteousness are you presenting? The one that is a gift by Christ Jesus or the one that you, you made yourself, you wove it yourself based on how much better than other people you are. We need to walk around as people who, who are in debt because it keeps us looking for what to give as opposed to what is due. 
Genesis chapter 1, chapter 17, verse 1, the Bible says, we're going to read through 9 very quickly. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to Abraham, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply, your, multiply you exceedingly. Then Abraham fell on his face and then God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Brother Ryan, the Lord is saying that this covenant that I'm cutting with you, Abraham, today, I'm going to repeat this covenant with every one of your descendants. So the way God said to Abraham, I know that you are nobility because the name Abraham means a noble person. Because you have been made nobility, you have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. God is saying that is only a starting point. I need you to father other people so your name will be called Abraham. Kings will come out from you. Nations will be blessed because of you. That is the covenant of God with each and every one of us. God is looking for friends because he called Abraham his friend. The Bible says by faith, Abraham became a friend of God because all that his life was about was imputed unto him for righteousness. The Bible did not say he earned the righteousness. It was gifted to him. And the reason why God gave him all of that privilege is because God saw the potential for him to be able to raise other people. You owe it to others. <laughs> this covenant, the fulfillment of this covenant. So when you have been called by God to raise other people, what business do you have putting them down? This is the covenant of God with Abraham. And God says for, for everlasting, for an everlasting covenant, as you have been called to father many nations, kings will come out of you. So will I maintain this covenant with all of those who come after you. And so can you see that we owe the Greek and the barbarians? We owe it to the Greek to not continue to see them be full of themselves. And we owe it to the barbarians to not continue to continue, to not continue in recklessness. We owe it to the wise not to be too wise in their own sight. We owe it to the unwise not to continue in their folly. We owe it to them because it is our responsibility to see men become kings and nomads become nations. When you begin to walk around with that mentality, then when somebody comes and they're lying to you, you are no longer offended that they're trying to deceive you. You are calculating how you will partner with heaven to deliver them from the spirit of lies. The Lord said to me, I heard this one as clear as you can hear me. The Lord said to me, <laughs> he says, to be an overcomer simply means to be a king. And the moment you are king, those that the Lord brings to you, you become responsible for them. Their success becomes your success. You will not see a king that wants his people to fail. Because when they fail, the kingdom fails. And when there's no kingdom, there is no king. You begin to be vested in other people as though your destiny depends on them. On their fulfillment. On the fulfillment of God's promise in their lives. Like I told you, after Saturday, no, no not this Saturday, I think it was Saturday last week when I told you that this year was... We're getting into 2024 where we are in the year 2024, the year that we overcome. I said it will be followed by teachings. So you came after you had been warned that these kind of teachings will come forth that would allow for us to be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. 
I'm going to keep that the last scripture for now unless I am seriously prompted to continue. But the summary of everything so far is that the Lord has done everything that he needs to do to see you become that overcomer. To see you become Abraham, the father of many nations, a father of many nations. To see you be one that raises people and not pull them down. God has done everything. He says everything that I promise you, I will perform it. The only thing that I want from you is you need to change your mind from being that of a person that keeps demanding things from people. You need to be one who walks around supplying things to people giving them the respect that they do not even merit because you have told yourself the word of God says I owe them so I'm going to pay them I know this is very unpopular because many people are so focused on oh, what is my purpose in life what is my destiny what is my this and that if we are faithful in this little we will begin to see more clearly where God wants us to go and what he wants us to do so in conclusion let us go and break bread with Revelations 22, verse 8. We're going to read that. But our real bread-breaking scripture is in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 11. We're going to read that first of all, break bread, and I'm going to read Revelations 22 to you. Jeremiah 1, 11. The Lord is ready to promote you and I, and that is the reason why the Lord is teaching us. Thank you, guys. The Lord is teaching us Humility, because the Bible says, if we would humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, he will lift us up. God is saying, I don't want you to be high-minded in the position that I have for you, because God is not going to give to you more than you can handle. God wants to give you a platform. God wants to give you a, a throne. God wants you to be an overcomer, a king, but he also wants for you to have a heart of compassion. God forbid that we become wicked kings. Psalms, I mean, Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 11. In fact, I can read this thing, same thing to you from 11 verse 1, but let's start with 11. It says, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I say, I see a branch of an almond tree. You know, when we break bread, we tap into the miracle of open eyes. Jay, when Jesus broke bread with the disciples on the way to Emmaus, what happened to them? Their eyes were open. They had walked with Jesus on a seven mile journey and they did not know that it was him. Until he broke bread. When Jesus appeared to his disciples, after they had gone fishing, waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit, and they were getting bored and hungry, and they went fishing, they did not know that it was him until he set a table for them to eat. And then immediately their eyes were open, and they were like, wow, it is not just an old man. It is the Lord. What is the morale of the story? The morale of the story or of these accounts is that we need to recognize that there is power in breaking bread for us to see. So what do we need to see today? The Lord is telling you that this is what he wants you and I to see so that we do not stumble as we mount the throne. And what is it? He says to Jeremiah, what do you see? Jeremiah says, I see a branch. Of a tree a branch of an almond tree the Lord is asking you today what do you see Jesus says I am the vine and you are the branches every time someone stands in front of you the Lord wants you to see them as a branch of the Lord Jesus Christ Jesus says I am the vine you are the branches when he asked Jeremiah, what do you see? Jeremiah says, I see a branch. Going forward, ladies and gentlemen, every time you have an opportunity to deal with your spouse, see them as a branch. See them as an extension of the Lord Jesus. All of that which Jesus did for you that you would want to pay back, pay it forward. The love that he showed to you that you would want to show to him. Do you know how many of us have imagined for thousands and thousands of hours what we're going to do the day we see Jesus? How you're going to hug him? How you're going to cry? How you're going to kiss him all over his face? How you will never let him go? 
All of the things that you would want to say to him, that joy and excitement. Jesus says, don't worry about me. You have all of eternity to do that. He said, but while you're still here and the time is ticking, extend that joy to the next person you see. Be excited to see them. Be delighted to show them the love that you want to show Jesus. Because they are the branches. But you have to see them as the branches. It is difficult sometimes to see people as an extension of the Lord Jesus. It is difficult to see people in the image and in the likeness of Christ when they are behaving like demons learn from them. You know, some people behave like they teach demons how to be wicked. David told you about those people. He said, these people, are, what's going on in their brains? Why are you setting me up to fail? What have I done to you? He couldn't think about the reason why those people were doing all of the stuff that they were doing. Why would you tell Z that about me? What, what do you get from it? You understand what I mean? Absolutely nothing. He doesn't do anything to you. The only thing he does is he pulls me down. And when I get pulled down, doesn't mean you're going to be lifted. You don't even want to be lifted because you're too afraid of prospering. So you just want more people to be in your loser's bracket. And, 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 yeah, and God wants me to see that person as a branch. Oh my God, rolling eyes emoji. But the reality of it is, if he's asking you to do it, it's because he's empowered you to do it. That is the reason why the Bible says, whatsoever you do to the least of the brethren, you do unto me. Do you know who the least of the brethren is? It's not the person who is the brokest in the room. The least of the brethren sometimes is the least lovable. But whatever you do to the least, even the least lovable person, Jesus says, you do it unto me. And so as we break bread tonight, I want you to say, Lord, may I see everyone as a branch. Let's, let's break bread. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for this injunction that you gave that we are able to keep by your grace. That as often as we have the opportunity to do this in remembrance of you. Please, if you haven't taken the communion, I want you to Raise your hand so they can give you one. We're not going to leave anybody behind today. The communion, there's no requirement other than for you to take it worthily. And what does it mean to take it worthily? To recognize that you are unworthy and that this is what makes you worthy. To take it worthily is to give all the glory to the captain of your salvation. Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you do not have a part in me. So there is nothing else I can do to qualify for having a part in him. It is not by my good behavior. It is not by my abstinence. It is not by my sacrifices. It isn't, it isn't by my, 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 my character. No, it is all by what he's done through his body broken and his blood shed. So please don't tell yourself you're not qualified. Jesus says you're qualified because this is what qualifies you for everything else. We all have the bread now and the wine, praise the Lord. So now, as often as we have the opportunity, we have to do this in remembrance of him. So Lord Jesus, thank you for the heart of obedience and for the privilege of this opportunity. This privilege, this opportunity. We eat of this bread and drink of this wine as your body and your blood respectively in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may eat and drink. Praise the Lord. God is very consistent in the way that he deals with us. So that it's easy for us to understand where he's coming from and who he is. What was the first thing he said to Abraham in Genesis that we just read? Genesis 17. He says, I am the almighty. I am almighty. Why did he say that? He said, I am almighty. Because he wants Abraham to know that I am the one that has the might to do everything. The reason why Abraham was barren until he was 99 years old was because God did not want him to take credit for anything whatsoever. God did not give him a child until his body was dead and the womb of Sarah was expired. God waited until they could not boast so that all excellency all honor, all power, and all the glory must belong to who? To God. So God says, I am the Almighty. Everything that I'm telling you in this covenant, I'm the one that will do it. 
I will make you the father of many nations. The only thing I don't want you to do is get in the way of what I am doing. You're my partner, not my opposition. So let us think of ourselves as God's partner in seeing to it that other people are forgiven, that other people are loved, and that ultimately other people are seen through on their journey to becoming kings. And you can start practicing that by inviting people out to no slumber, November. Because we know people who are living prayerless lives. Unless you are prayerless yourself. Even if you are prayerless, you, you would also know your, your colleagues. The people who are prayerless like you. But if you are prayerful, it's even easier for you to recognize the people who have not been praying. Because they are afraid of everything, they are afraid of everyone, and they are afraid every time. They complain every time you see them. Their lives are not progressing, they are retrogressing, they used to be nice, and now they are nasty and, come and disgruntled. They need that fire to drive away all the flies that have come to settle upon the anointing of God over their lives. The Bible says that the, the flies, they cause the oil of the anointing to send forth a stinking smell. So how do we drive out the flies? We need the flame. And so we need to invite people. Let's bring them. Like my wife said on Saturday, we're not just looking to fill the room. We've had meetings here with just maybe two or three rows. And, and God still spoke concerning world events. Even though the whole world was not here. To listen to it. You understand what I mean? And so we're not moved and we're not concerned about filling up the place. We are only concerned about raising other people. Some people will not become until you tell them. Jesus says, how would they know unless you tell them? So I want to encourage you, bring somebody out here on the 4th of November and tell them that you don't want them to get lost on the 4th of November so maybe they can practice by coming here this Saturday so at least they know the way. They know where they're going. You see what I mean? And then maybe they need to come here one time before the 4th so that they can get used to all of our nuances so that they're not distracted by how we do things when the time comes. You know, whatever you need to tell them, you know, you're the salesperson. I'm just here to encourage you. You need to invite people to come out to No Slumber November because the word of the Lord came forth. When my wife said it on Saturday, many people didn't get it. She said, I was there when the Lord told my husband. And the reason why she said that was because when the Lord told me, it hit me. I jumped up from where I was and I was like, it's, called, it's going to be called No Slumber November. And she was like, what will be called No Slumber November? Are you trying to get a dog? No, she didn't say that, but she was just like, what are you talking about? I said, the Lord said to me, first week in November, we need to bring people together so that they can receive light from us. They can be ignited from the flame that we have received. When you come in here, you know that we pray. So let somebody else benefit from that. So no slumber November. The last thing I'm going to do very quickly is I may not teach on this subject, but I want to read this scripture to you and then you can go and meditate on it. Uh, I feel like I owe that to you and I don't want to uh, owe anybody anything tonight. I want to pay all my debts. So Revelations 22 verse 8. And we will close. Um, Rain, I hope your friend told you that sometimes we're here and we close seven times before we finally close. Oh, that's good. So we're going to be out of here today. While it is called today, I believe that. Revelation chapter 22, verse 8. Jesus says, I mean, sorry, now this is John. He says, now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I had heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then the angel said to me, see that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant. And of your brethren and the prophets. And of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. May the Lord give us understanding. I told you I'm not going to preach on it. But I want you to go and meditate on it. What I got out of it is this. Or one of the things that I got out of it is this. Regardless of where God has placed me in life. And in the lives of other people. They do not owe me worship. If anything at all, I must always see myself as one of them. This guy was like the same angel of the Lord that was taking me through time. He flew me 500 years into the future, 1,000 years into the past. He was taking me back and forth. 
He took me to the presence of God, brought me back. This same angel. This person needs to be worshipped. And the angel of the Lord says, no, 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 no. no. We're, to, we're the same. He says, I am of your brethren. The reason why many times we struggle to be able to accommodate people and to be able to submit ourselves to serve other people is because we think because God has sent us. To be an angel means to be a sent one. Because God has sent you, now they have to worship you. They do not have to worship you. If anything at all, you have to serve them. And so I want to encourage you, let us apply our hearts to humility because where God is taking us, He wants us to be able to stay there. God bless you, Communion House, Alan. Oh, Chris and Kayla. Yes, so I don't know about anyone else, but I feel like Pastor Moses pulled a chair up and spoke to me the entire time. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that. Lots of wonderful things to take back um, and, and exercise and practice and implement in my everyday life. So wonderful, wonderful word. Um, today is Tuesday, so we're going to second watch Tomorrow, uh, let's join Alan, a time for prayer in the spirit, building up our most holy faith. Second watch uh, tomorrow at 9 p.m. on Instagram at Communion House. Um, pastor Moses touched on No Slumber November, um, November 4th at 6.30. So let's make sure we invite all of our friends and loved ones out to that event. Yeah. I pass it over to Chris to do the tithes and offering. Oh. <laughs> Shout out to my beautiful wife here doing her thing. Um, let's not forget Saturday. We got Saturday worship uh, starting at 6.30 p.m. Um, yes, amen. So if you make your uh, ways up to the screen there, we've got the tithes and other offerings and the giving details on the screen. Uh, we've got uh, checks cash app uh, dollar sign communion house along with the zelle details and the paypal details and our dear brother uh kenyatta here has the uh, giving basket as well so just going to give you all a little times to get uh some things together here and uh we'll bless the offering and the ties All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We just thank you for providing for us in the many ways that you do, be it physical, be it spiritual. Lord, we are just thankful, and we just ask that you bless these offering and tithes and just lift them up to just build your kingdom and allow us to just continue to, to grow in your word and your name, Father. We just thank you for the, the man of God and the woman of God that you have blessed us with, and we just praise you for Communion House and where you're taking us. And Lord, just thanks for everything that you're doing and everything you've done. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Oh, here goes my dear brother, Alan. <laughs> Let's celebrate our brother and sister, Chris and Kayla. God is good. As we close out, I just want to remind us of our dear brother, John. He's not here tonight. But one thing I was encouraged by as pastor was sharing about No Slumber November. Since I have been a part of Communion House, I believe he's been the brother that I've seen invite the most and they actually come. You see, and so uh, we just want to celebrate being a, an example to the believer and let that be encouragement to us to bring as many as we can to be led in who we're inviting, knowing the ones that the Lord has set before us. Amen, because it's going to be a great time. It's going to be off the chain. Uh, the other nights that we have come, we have always left with something, been able to carry that presence home. You see impartation, stirring up. We all need that in this hour. Amen. God is good. Everyone have a blessed night.